welcome to our show. Today we discuss about context and how you can create awesome high quality content by sharing value as maximum is possible in your context. I'm excited to discuss this topic with Melanie Diesel. How are you? Good, good. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing great. It's a big pleasure to yeah. get you on my show, to learn from you. And before we start, just tell more about your self-experience background and about your book that I can see on your background. <laughs> yes, well, thank you for having me. It's really nice to be here. I'm glad we get to chat today. Um, if anyone uh, doesn't know me, I'm Melanie Diesel. Um, I am the VP of Marketing and co-founder uh, of The Convoy, which helps small businesses save money. So it's a big part of what I'm focused on now, but my background is all in content marketing. So uh, the book you see over my shoulder is the content fuel framework and it's all about how to generate content ideas so coming up with ideas for what you could say about your brand how to communicate with your audience um, i was the first ever editor of branded content at the new york times and also served as director of creative strategy at time incorporated so i was overseeing the branded content for all 35 of our u.s magazines so it's uh it's been quite a journey from journalism into uh the world of content marketing but uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun yeah love it love your experience and uh, uh you mentioned that you can help uh smb to save money you know uh, uh, you remind me uh, my story when um, i graduated um, uh, i got not good salary like uh or like every everyone else but you know uh during some time i opened my first business and could earn uh, 30 times more for six months yeah and uh, that was interesting i was not good to handle all this money i uh, spent everything everything <laughs> before 2008 when the world crisis destroyed my company when i lost all my uh investments money everything and after that i started to learn more how i can save my money uh, because uh, i think uh, if you want to grow you need to know how to spend and uh, don't yeah. buy some nonsense uh, or something that you don't need at all you know uh, can you tell uh, how to set up the right mindset uh, for someone who wanna uh, save money uh, yeah. and yeah because we don't know what uh, can future can bring yeah absolutely yeah so you know for uh, what we're doing at the convoy is is slightly different hopefully setting folks up so that they don't get into a situation where they don't have that cash flow because we know that you know cash flow is the number one reason that small businesses end up closing is lack of cash flow um, so we're trying to hopefully get ahead of that and and one of the things we do is essentially essentially take the buying power of all these independent businesses and use that to negotiate better pricing, negotiate discounts, because, you know, you may be one small business, um, but it's hard to compete with a chain store or, you know, a franchise or a national corporation because they have a thousand stores and they get better pricing because of that volume. So we're sort of treating all of our small business members almost like a chain, right? We take all of their buying power together and say, we've got a thousand small businesses. So we want that same rate. We want that cheaper rate for our small business members. So, you know, the mindset I think is, it's a couple different things. It's one, you know, you want to be looking at your business with a critical eye always to, to make sure that you're not spending in places that you don't need to be or or maybe something that you're not using anymore. Uh, I know I'm guilty of this where I get a renewal for a subscription of a tool that I forgot I signed up for. Um, so, you know, those kinds of things, having a critical eye is is really helpful, but also just looking for new opportunities of ways you could do things more efficiently. Um, I think personally, if, if you are similar to me, like working in a business where you are kind of the business, whether you're you know, a consultant or a writer, a creator, something like that. Um, it's really easy to forget that our time is actually money, right? So yeah. if, if you only make money when you are working, then looking at the ways that you spend your time is is really important. You could be losing money simply by being inefficient or being distracted. So there's there's a lot that could go into it. But uh, at the end of the day, that's that's really what we're hoping to do is is help more independent and small business owners uh, you know, make it for the long haul because we know how important they are for for their communities. Yeah, for me, uh, time is the uh, time is the biggest asset ever. You know, more than money, uh, more than anything else. Because you know, yeah. you can lose money. Uh, I, I lost my, all my money two times in my life, uh, actually in Ukraine. Because in two thousand eight. 
the world crisis destroyed my first financial company. Uh, you know, this company helped others to get banking loans. Uh, but uh, mm -hmm. when Ukrainian government decided to disallow all banking loans, uh, you know, I lost my business for a few days, you know. Uh, then uh, in 2013, uh, the Ukrainian revolution destroyed my second business. So, and But, you know, I got experience. I got experience how to go ahead, how, how to handle money. So uh, right now I have the reserve fund. Uh, so uh, and um, yeah, we have a new event in Ukraine, uh, very hard time uh, with this war with Russia. And, you know, yeah. And uh, uh, luckily, I had my reserve fund, my uh, experience to go ahead with that. So, yeah. And you mentioned about ideas. Can you tell? Because, you know, uh, my customers, uh, my audience um, often ask uh, the question how to find ideas. Personally, for me, no, uh, I have no time to post all my ideas. I have a yeah. bunch of ideas, a lot of them. <laughs> and I don't know how to uh, post all of them because uh, uh, I have only two hands. I can post like 10 times a day uh, because many other things to do. If I have more time, like 40 hours um, uh, uh, a day, you know, then I ca can post like 20 times a day. Can you tell how to find ideas for someone who is struggling to find it? Yeah, so it's it's nice. That's actually a pretty good problem to have, right? Having so many ideas, you don't know what to post. We find that a lot of folks are on the other side where they're like, I don't know what to say. Like, what, what do I tell people about my business? How do I walk the line of being promotional, but not too promotional so that people still want to follow or engage with me? So um, in the book, we walk through a system of basically, you kind of want to break like an idea, a content idea, you want to break it into two parts. When we try to think of it as just an idea, it's a little too vague. So we want to break it into two parts. Uh, the first part is the focus. So that's like the message. What are we saying? What are we actually, you know, trying to convey? And then the second part is the format. That's how we're going to say it. So that's in this case, like live video or a podcast or written content, right? So you want to kind of start with that focus. How, what is it that I want to say? And once you figure that out, then you ask the question, what's the best way for me to say that? How do I bring it to life? Um, I think that mindset shift of thinking of a content idea as two separate things um, actually makes it a lot easier because content idea is like this big thing. You know, it feels like, I don't know, like you have to be a genius or an artist. Like it just so um, it's so undefined. And I think if you break it down into smaller parts, it feels a little bit easier. So uh, you know, and in the book, what I do is I essentially walk through 10 different focuses and 10 different formats, just options that you can use. And with 10 times 10, you end up with 100 different ways you could tell any story just by combining those focuses and formats. So trying to turn it into a system, you know, make make patterns easier to see and, and hopefully make it easy that you don't have to start from a blank spot. You could start with some of these combinations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, love it. Yeah, totally. Exactly. Uh, start small and go step by step to increase. Uh, you know, what do you think about uh, uh, quantity versus quality? Many content creators proclaim that you need to create only high quality content. But, you know, yeah. uh, from my experience, I disagree with that. I can tell <laughs> why. For example, for, for Google, yes. We need to create high quality content because yeah. Google uh, will rank only super high quality content. But yeah. for social media, it's not. Uh, you know, it's the number of game. Uh, I can spend like uh, uh, a few days to create one post, uh, so valuable post with many insights, <laughs> and get a hundred views. You know, but when I spend like five minutes to share some story, <laughs> some uh, simple uh, things, you know, valuable but simple, and yeah. Yeah, like uh, ten thousand views, you know, from one yeah. post. Uh, sometimes <laughs> I I got like. 300,000 views from one simple post, you know, and I got it. No way. For me, it's better quantity than quality because social media, uh, all posts are done for a few hours, uh, sometimes for a few days, you know. Yeah. Can you tell uh, how to find this balance between quantity and quality? Oh, I wish I knew the magic formula <laughs> for the perfect balance. Um, I always say that our audience will usually tell us when we have the right balance. And so mm -hmm. looking at numbers like that, you know, understanding your metrics and saying, okay, when I post more than this many times a day, I lose followers. Or when I don't post this many times, my views go down, you know, kind of trying to look at your analytics and connect the patterns between your behavior and what you're doing, what you're posting and then the results that you're getting, that's usually the best way to kind of follow those insights and see what's working well. Um, 
but yeah, it is, it is definitely a balance and it really depends on where you are too. You know, if, if you're on a place like, like, uh, like Twitter, you know, the shelf life of a tweet is, is minutes, right? It usually doesn't, doesn't pick up steam much long after that. If you go a few minutes with no interaction, that's probably as, as good as it's going to get. Right. So the, the tolerance for, you know, lower quality content is actually really high because there's just another tweet just, you know, of one little bit away. You see the same kind of thing on TikTok where you'll often see a creator kind of re record the same video, the same either message or joke or skit, but they do it like three slightly different ways just in rapid fire to see which one lands and which one gets traction. So it is kind of this, this back and forth of, of testing to see. Um, what I would say is that the bigger and less frequent your content, um, the, the more high quality you want it to be. So with something like, you know, a book or a show, you know, a, um, a television show, a podcast, uh, a video series, if people are investing a significant amount of time into that, then, and it's garbage, like they're not going to stick around for the next one, you know? So especially when you're creating any sort of series or like bigger content, you want to make sure you bring the value um, cause you know, if, if you're wasting one second of their time with a, you know, a silly tweet, that's one thing, but if you're wasting 30, 60, 90 minutes of their time, the tolerance goes way, way down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. You know, uh, I, many times, uh, someone, uh, unfollowed me or unsubscribed on my YouTube, uh, because of silly things, but you know, I got experience. Uh, what <laughs> don't work, you know, so I need to change approaches. Uh, and I think, yeah, I, I agree completely. You need to test to find your form. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say it. I, I The other thing I encourage people to do is like, don't stress about unfollows too much. I would only yeah. look at them in volume, right? If you do something and then you lose like a hundred or a thousand or 5,000 followers, like that's something to pay attention to. Um, I know that there's a lot of folks who kind of watch those numbers really closely. And if they lose one or two, they're like, what have I done? You know, what, where did I go wrong? <laughs> um, but you know, social media, it just ebbs and flows that way. There's going to be people who are always trying to, you know, simplify their life and they want fewer notifications and it might not even be anything personal, right? Like they may just not recognize your profile picture anymore and, and forgot who you were. Right. So I always say, you know, just a few here and there, I wouldn't worry too much, but if you start to see a big spike, that's when you would pay attention. Um, and the yeah. question to ask then too is, is that something that I'm okay with because the thing that I did was worth my, was worth it, was important. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this is something that comes up if you have, if you're expressing any sort of like political views, you're talking about religion, you're talking about, you know, your values and beliefs. Some people aren't going to like that. But if that's important to who you are and you're OK with that, then OK. If, you know, I lose 100 followers because I, you know, make a claim about what my values are, then those people probably shouldn't have stuck around anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you lose 100 followers, you can get experience, you know, how to get a lot more in the future. So for yeah. me, uh, yeah, uh, many times uh, I lost followers. Uh, I think that's okay, you know, but uh, when you have experience, you can improve your quality of content and go ahead with yeah. that and get a thousand followers after that. Uh, I have the question, you know, uh, about uh, creating content strategy. Can you tell how to create content strategy? Because I check out a few studies online that... Uh, if I remember correctly, like 36% of all companies have a documented content strategy. And most of them just don't know what to post, how to go ahead. They have no yeah. plans. Can you tell how to find and create your content strategy? You know, this is one of those questions. I think part of the reason why we see so many folks saying, like, I don't have a, a content strategy is because it's something that can be kind of difficult to document you probably know in your head already what kind of content you want to create, how frequently you want to create it, but it's not really clear how exactly, where do we put that and what form should that strategy document take? Um, so I think a lot more people have content strategy. They just haven't documented it somehow. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a tough question. And I think it also depends on the size of the organization. So if it's just you, it's pretty easy to whip up a document and throw in there, like I'm gonna post here three times a week, here two times a week, this is the type of content, here's my goals. Um, if it's a much larger organization with you know 15 different social accounts and all these different departments, it gets a lot more complicated to get anyone to agree on anything. So mm -hmm. you know, it, it can definitely be a challenge. Um, I think that the 
best place to start, no matter the size of your organization or, you know, whether this is your first content strategy or a new one, uh, you know, or your 10th one is to really think about the goals. Um, it is so easy to get caught up in, you know, a routine of just creating, 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 and forget that we're doing this to get some sort of result. And that result might be sales. It might be engagement. It might be just growing awareness. It might be just building our reputation. There's a lot of different reasons and they're all valid um, to be creating this content. But I think the very first step, no matter how deep you go or, or what form it takes, um, you know, coming back to that like focus versus format is like, what is it that we're actually trying to achieve? What is it that we're trying to say? Who is our audience? Like really just getting clear on your purpose makes the rest of the stuff so much easier. Because if you understand who I'm talking to and why, then figuring out, well, where are those people? That's where I should be posting. And what's their expectation of content? That's the kind of quality I have. It kind of starts to answer itself. But that's the hardest thing is if you don't have that clarity, you're not sure who your exact audience is or, um, you know, content for content's sake is not going to get you very far. You have to have that, that goal, that purpose that's really clear to you. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell how to learn audience? Uh, for example, if uh, businesses don't know their audiences, um, um, uh, even more. Uh, uh, I've learned one story from iHrefs, and uh, uh, that was interesting. It's a big company. Uh, I don't know the value, but like uh, probably a billion dollars. I don't know. But uh, and uh, Tim Solo, uh, CMO of this company, uh, shared on uh, one podcast that. Uh, Oh, uh, that uh, it's hard for them to create a buying persona, mm. very hard because uh, yeah. audience is very broad. You know, uh, male, female, different ages, uh, religions, sure. countries. Tell how to learn audience if you have so broad audience and uh, stick with that. Yeah, I think we um, we kind of are always drawn to the more visual thing, right? So like male, female, how old are they? What's this job? Because we can see those things easily and, and understand them. Um, but I think if your audience is that diverse in terms of their background and where they live and, you know, who they are as a person, they're all trying to solve a very similar problem um, or they all face a very similar challenge. So, um, you know, in, in the case of like, just hrefs since you, you brought up that example like they're people who want to improve their search their, their seo like that's the problem mm -hmm. they're trying to solve whether mm -hmm. they're an individual or a business or a gigantic business or a team of one or a team of 50 or whatever country they're in they're united by that characteristic by the desire to better understand and improve uh you know their understanding of of search um, and so I think sometimes if you can't, if you can't like see it with your eyes that like all of my consumers are this type of business or this type, you know, this gender, this, whatever, um, it's probably more of a question of, well, what are they trying to achieve? What are their challenges? Um, what stage of life are they in? Um, you know, when you look at like the wedding industry, for example, um, I mean, people get married when they're 19, they get married when they're 90, they get married, you know, in a gazebo outside, they get married, like on the beach, there's so many different aspects, you know, their, their gender, you know, who they're marrying, there's a big wedding, a small wedding, there's, there's so many different factors, but they're all at that stage of life where they've found this person that they want to spend their life with, and they want to celebrate that with the people that they care about. So you can kind of like bring them all together under that that shared challenge or shared experience or shared stage of life um, and create content that speaks to that instead of some of the other stuff. Um, so, you know, yeah, coming back to that Ahrefs example, uh, instead of creating content about, you know, your small business search, your large business search, just talk about like how to learn about search. And, you know, Ahrefs does a fantastic job with this, a lot of educational content, um, how to use the tool better, what to look for, how to identify keywords. I mean, the best out there in terms of providing educational content and free tools. Um, but again, regardless of, you know, where you live or, or who you love, you know, they have this, uh, this library of really helpful content that speaks to that shared challenge and that shared goal. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I want to share uh, uh, something from my uh, insights. You know, for example, I check out that my audience is different on LinkedIn uh, 
uh, from YouTube, from <laughs> my website. And, you know, for example, when I, I try to set up the same message on YouTube and LinkedIn, of course, I repurpose content uh, because uh, to save my time. But yeah, I found the audience is different, you know, really different. And yeah. if you, you set up paid ads, it's better to uh, consider your specific audience on social media platforms. Uh, I have uh, another question. How to yeah. find this platform where to promote your content? Yeah, so you were getting to it right there, which is the audience, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think what I like to think about it as these social platforms are like different places that you show up. Um, you can still be the same person, but the stories you tell and the topics you talk about are probably very different if you're showing up at like your niece or nephew's birthday party with a clown there versus like going to the pub with your friends or at a job interview. You're still the same person. You still have the same interests, but the things you talk about and the way you talk about them is probably different in all those different scenarios. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of a, a similar experience when you're looking at these networks, you know, the things that I like to talk about on LinkedIn, um, I'm very business oriented. It's like tactical articles that are helpful, things you can learn from, you know, announcements about, um, you know, like awards that are coming up or events that I might be speaking at. But if you go over to uh, Instagram, you'd never know any of those things. I'm not, I'm not sharing educational content about, you know, content marketing. It's more my family and friends that are there. So I'm talking about my travel and where I'm going and like, you know, what my toddler's up to and, you know, that we got a new cat, you know, those kinds of things, um, you know, tend to do better there because of who's there and what they're expecting. So once you have some clarity on like, what is that shared challenge or, you know, the other details about your audience, that next question to ask is where do they hang out and what do they do there? So if you find like these, you know, you can do that by experimenting, you can look at research that's out there about where different demographics hang out. But um, once you find out where they are, you want to be present there for that conversation. Um, and mm -hmm. I, I always remind people, you know, we have a, a habit of looking at what we tend to like, you know, like I'm, I'm a Twitter person. I love being on Twitter. That's where I, that's where I like to hang out. So I have to manually override and say like, not every audience is on Twitter. Not everyone that I want to talk to is there. So you kind of have to like take your own preferences out of it a little bit. And, you know, they may be on Reddit, the folks that we want to talk to, they may be in private Facebook groups, you know, they may be in all kinds of different places. So it's kind of a fun, I think it's a fun process kind of experimenting and seeing where folks show up. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I have the question about, um, uh, you know, uh, for example, uh, we know the phrase never give up. Yes, and uh, but I see <laughs> that content creators give up so fast, you know, uh, yeah. be, in most cases because they can't get uh, engagement, they can't get results. And uh, uh, for example, um, from one study, I found that uh, 50% of all uh, audio podcasters who create this uh, podcast, they usually uh, don't record the second episode, you know, <laughs> a lot <laughs> because Aww. they can't get results from the first episode. You know, yeah. I remember, I remember when I post uh, like six months without any engagement on social media, just one like, a few comments, not yeah. a lot. Uh, but you know, I, I love the process to search, to find what work for me, how I can handle, how I can change. Can you tell how to go ahead if you have no results, if you yeah. have no engagement? And yeah, more about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, I think you are exactly right. You know, when it comes to content, sometimes the the path to success is much longer. Um, a great example I like to give of this is if you think of any long running TV show, you want to think of Game of Thrones or Friends or whatever, they had so much of a bigger audience at the end toward the final season, the final episode than they ever had for the pilot or season one or season two or season three, right? It grows over time. Um, mm -hmm. So you have to give your content and your audience a chance to do the same thing. Like, it takes time to find the right folks to get into your groove, to make that connection, to start word of mouth as a next layer. Um, it just takes some time. Uh, and I think mm -hmm. a lot of the marketing that we do, we need results faster because it's more direct response. And so in those cases, sometimes what's happening is I need more sales. So I'm going to start a podcast, probably not in a lot good alignment of goals and what's likely to create those goals. If you need more sales, you want to be looking at like buying direct response ads. You need strong calls to action. Like you're going to go in a different direction or, or probably should than something like a podcast or a blog or something else that, that takes a while to build audience. Um, 
But the other thing that I think happens a lot, and especially with like those short lived podcasts is I think in a lot of cases, uh, especially if you're at a business and you're like a one man content show, which we know is the case a lot of times, like we never have enough resources, we never have a big enough team. I think we bite off more than we can chew. I think mm -hmm. we feel a lot of pressure to be on every network and creating every kind of content and 10 times a day here and three times a day <laughs> there and two times over here. Now I'm making TikToks and I'm taking it, you know, it can get, it can get really overwhelming. And like the reality is we don't like you said earlier, we only have what, you know, 24 hours a day. There's only so much you can do. And so uh, oftentimes my, my, my suggestion, which doesn't always go, go across well, is like, we need to do less. You need to do less because if you're putting 5% of effort into all these different places, you're also only going to get 5% of the results. Like you're not putting in enough effort to make a difference. I would rather you write one awesome blog post a month that's in depth, that has tons of sources, right? Then write a crappy one every single week because those you know, they're not going to do anything for you if you're not uh, building up your audience's expectations, you're not staying true to yourself, you're cutting yourself out of the time you need to do stuff that drives results and that you're proud of. So, you know, sometimes we just we're trying to do too much. And I'm guilty of that myself. You know, please don't go look at the last time I updated my blog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, interesting. Okay, guys, you can find uh, this blog in the description <laughs> below, <laughs> and you can criticize, share oh, your blog, no. or anything. I, I mean, I I try to be honest about that stuff too because I feel like I don't I don't know about you all, but there's a lot of folks in the marketing space, especially who are like mascots for hustling, you know. And it's always mm -hmm. like post every day, and like everything's great, and I have all this success. Um, and I feel like that's just, it's not real. Like we're actual people. Like I have a kid, I have a house, I have a job. Like I can't just spend all day engaging on Twitter. Would I like to? Sure. But that's mm -hmm. not realistic. Right. And so when you're comparing yourself to these people whose full-time job it is to be a creator who do nothing but spend all day on TikTok because that's how they make money, you will never spending 20 minutes a day, you will never achieve the same results as that person. It's just not going to happen. So, you know, you kind of got to like be realistic. Like maybe I'm not, you know, blogging is not something I can really commit to right now. You yeah. know, I, I did commit for a while before, uh, before I had my daughter to a YouTube series, I was doing free content idea Friday. And I would just sort of like brainstorm about user suggested topics for content. And it was awesome. And I enjoyed it. But once that kid came along, like, I couldn't be doing a YouTube video every week. Like I, I no longer could keep that commitment. So I had to shift my strategy to something more realistic, you know? So I think it's important to like acknowledge that. Cause I think, especially, especially if you're a young creator, it can, you know, or new in your career, you've recently changed into the, into the space. Like it just feels like everybody's doing everything and they're not, you know, we just don't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with that because uh, it depends on priorities. If your priority uh, is to, I don't know, like family or a job, uh, it's up to you, you know. For me, it's much, uh, it's important to enjoy the process. If you love what you do, if you like the process, uh, for example, uh, if you, uh, for example, um, uh, if you play soccer or tennis or anything else, you are not waiting when someone will pay money for that. Uh, you're not waiting when you get some benefits from that. You just enjoy the process. It's the yep. same with social media. You know, yeah. just post, just create content. Yeah. If you don't enjoy it, if you, uh, by the way, I know uh, many folks who uh, dislike to write. That's okay, you know, find other approaches. Yeah. Film video content, audio podcasts. Many, many things you can do. So uh, yeah. uh, the main reason you need to enjoy the process uh, to be on Twitter, LinkedIn. By the way, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned a few times about uh, TikTok. And my son, 11 years old, asked me, why do you post on LinkedIn? Uh, TikTok is much better place, you know. And yeah. we decided to uh, set up competition uh, and he beats me three times oh. on TikTok. He has a lot more <laughs> engagement. Uh, <laughs> When but he's probably he... spending all day there, right? You can't compete with that. You got to pay uh, bills. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but no, no. I, I told him uh, you can't spend oh, the whole day. You need to uh, handle your school as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but uh, and uh, I like when he creates content. When he just watching video, no, I, it's it's not the stuff that I'm looking for. But you know, and he, he beats me three times on TikTok. He gets a lot 
uh, more followers, engagement. Uh, for me, it's hard to understand his content, you know, but mm -hmm. his audience loves it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Finding the right, the right audience fit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's better to enjoy the process. Okay, I have the question uh, about uh, improving skills. Can you tell, uh, for example, you wrote a book. For me, it's like next level because I'm going to write <laughs> my book but i don't know when i uh, when i will be ready probably i can ready today uh, i can do it today i can do it tomorrow but many other priorities i have can yeah. you tell how to improve uh, writing skills because many companies even big companies uh, even my clients yeah. uh, uh, who i don't know like who can earn million dollars but they don't know how to write and yeah. uh, when i ask them uh what's going on they reply to me you know i i need to compete with my competitors uh i need to develop and invite my products uh and it's not my priority to write can you tell uh, them how to improve the skills you know yeah so first thing if you actually want to improve your skills this book which is literally called everybody writes uh your go-to guide to creating ridiculously good content by ann hanley like mm -hmm. i can't tell you how many copies of this book i've given away uh this is like the Bible, like you need, you need to get this. This is going to help you get through uh, a lot of that stuff and feel more confident in your writing as well. Um, but the other thing is like, just like we were saying before, you know, you don't necessarily have to approach writing a book the same way. Um, first off, if you don't want anything to do with it, if you haven't gotten time, there are folks that you can hire to ghostwrite your book. They will look through all the content you've already made, your emails, your blog post, whatever you already have, and they will help organize that content, right? So it's a little bit like having a personal chef. Like you already have all the ingredients. You just need someone to come in and put them together for you. So that's an option. Um, you can also lean into whatever format uh, is more comfortable for you. So uh, if you are someone who likes to speak off the cuff, you know, maybe you have a bunch of podcasts like this where you have the audio that you could get transcribed, do that. Speak into your microphone, record it, get it transcribed, and now you're halfway there. Um, so there are a lot of ways that you could get to that same goal without having to force yourself if writing is something that is your barrier, right? Because if, if the fear of writing or the discomfort with writing is keeping you from getting that idea out, then one, maybe it doesn't need to be a book. Maybe it needs to be something else, like a video or you know whatever. Um, but two, that there are tools and people who can help you bridge that gap between what you want to create and what you have the time and resources to create. So definitely that. Um, but the mm -hmm. other thing is honestly, like it's just reps. It's we made the you made the reference to like playing soccer, right? Playing tennis. I mean, how do you get good? You just play a lot. You practice a lot. Um, yeah. And I know that sounds really really simple, but like. You know, I didn't sit down one day and just write this book out of nowhere. Like I studied journalism. I used to write a story a day, two stories a day when I was working in journalism. I've written, I can't even tell you how many articles, blog posts, captions for social media, uh, you know, eBooks. I just, you practice, right? So it's something that comes with time. And the other thing I'll tell you, again, I think it's important to be honest about this stuff. Like writing a book was hard. Like it was not easy. No, but I promise you any, any book you've ever written, no matter how easy it, it seems when you're reading it, like nobody sits down and just like writes a book, right? It's like an eight month process of writing little bits and pieces and getting edits and feedback and rewriting. Like it's messy. It's messy. It just looks nice when you're done. Um, so some of that discomfort, like it's just part of the process. Um, the only way I found to get through this book, and I have another book coming out later this year, um, the only way I got through either of them is breaking it down into much smaller pieces. So this, when I wrote this book, I literally had a spreadsheet that outlined all the different chapters. In each chapter, I needed this research. I needed this example. I needed this comparison, right? And it was each one was aligned on a spreadsheet. So I always knew, okay, all I have to do right now is find the research for this particular topic that's it. I can do that. Right. Instead of, I need to sit down and write my book. Like that's always going to be terrifying. That's a big task. Right. So if you could break it down, um, write in little pieces, you know, find, uh, you know, find what, what you're feeling inspired to do, uh, whenever you sit down to write, that's, it's going to help you get to the finish finish line a lot sooner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Uh, if you can share this book, uh, yeah. on Amazon, um, I'll share with my audience, you know, and when sure. you have a new book, Sure, I'll share this book as well. Okay, yeah. I, I have the question about editing. Can you tell how it is important to edit a text after writing? Because, you know, uh, I check out that some book offers have like five, ten editors for one book. Can you tell more about that? 
Yeah. So um, funny story. I actually went and after I graduated and studying journalism, I got my master's degree and I wanted to be an editor. So I know way more about this than you probably care to know. Um, but there are different types of editors, which is probably why you see those names many times. So some editors are really good at just the grant, right? How do we spell this? The comma, the hyphen, like they're really just there for the yeah. mechanics. Um, that usually comes at the very end. That's, you know, a copy editor. Um, but earlier on, you usually have a content editor, and that's the person who reads it at a very high level. They don't care about the commas and the spelling. They're way up here saying, okay, I feel like you need more over here. I don't really understand this topic, or it's not clear how these two things relate to each other. Maybe you need to bring this out, or that last chapter really needs to be the first chapter, right? So they're doing big idea stuff. And then in the middle, you have other types of editors that are like various points along that spectrum of really high level to like really nitty gritty details. Um, you may also have a fact, a fact checker in there. Some editors, their whole specialty is like digging in and finding the sources and making sure that dates are right, making sure that names are right, that places are right. You know, they can kind of confirm all those nitty gritty details. So it takes an army. It takes an army uh, to make the book. But I think if, again, for a big project, when you're concerned about quality and quality is really important, um, that, that that stuff is is really important. Even if you're self-publishing, like find someone on Fiverr, uh, find your friend who majored in, in, you know, in writing something, have a second set of eyes look at it because no matter how good you are, um, you are reading with what you already know. And you need someone who doesn't already know all of that stuff to read it, to find the gaps. Because you already know you're going to fill those blanks in yourself because it's coming from your head. Um, so a second set of eyes is, is so vital. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, about self-publishing, uh, um, uh, I've listened to one episode and I don't remember the name of this author. And he yeah. uh, he shared that it's better today to be self-publisher than uh, to handle the process to recognizable publishers because they will limit uh, many things uh, with your book. What do you think yeah. about that? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I worked with a hybrid publisher on mine, which essentially means that I hired uh, a team of publishing type folks mm -hmm. to, to help do that work, right? So um, there's there's advantages to both sides. Um, when you work with a traditional publisher, you get all those resources. You might get an advance, you know, payment in advance on the book, which if you're self-publishing, you don't, you don't get that. Mm -hmm. um, that you might get higher quality of people because they're paying the bills instead of you. You may be limited in how much you could pay a designer or an editor. Mm -hmm. um, so there are some advantages. And, uh, and the, the one thing that is is different, of course, is like the intellectual property. Like I own the ideas in that book. I can decide if I make another book, if I turn it into something else. I could decide what the title was and the chapters and the, the design. Like that was up to me. So if that kind of control is super important for you, then you may want to go the hybrid or self-published route so you can maintain that control and, and make all those decisions. Um but you know, you are you are on your own. Like nothing is gonna make that book sell if you don't do it, right? It go li goes live on Amazon. It's only gonna sell as many copies as you help it sell when you self-publish. So you really gotta put in the effort and be prepared for uh, for that long haul process, which which can be a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, got it. Valuable. Okay, uh, I have the final question about the future of content. Can you tell what kind of future can you predict? You know, because we have many things that will ca are, are coming, like I don't know, metaverse, web, free uh, no zero. What yeah. do you think about the future? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I think the one thing we've all learned the last three years is like nobody knows what's going to happen. Everything is just like up up for grabs. Um, I think there's some trends that will probably continue. So one thing that I love is that we are seeing content um, expand into new places. So I, I don't have insights on this yet, but as people are talking about the metaverse, I'm excited to see how brands find a place in the metaverse, how they use that to communicate with their audience. Um, I As there's conversations about more AR and VR, especially in gaming, like I'm excited to see how content creation happens in those spaces and the roles that, that brands play there. Um, all this talk about NFTs, like I haven't seen a ton of projects from brands, but I think there's a big opportunity there, especially, um, you know, brands with a, a rabid fan base. I know like the NBA has done some limited drops and things like that. So I, I, what I like is watching how content comes to have new meanings each time there's a new platform or a new format, you know, 
our creativity is put to the test to see, well, how do we, how do we tell stories of value in this environment? Um, to me, that's super fun. Um, and the other thing that mm -hmm. I think we'll continue to see is like, for lack of a better word, like content creation has been getting more and more democratized over the course of time. Um, you know, without, without guessing your age, like when you and I were young, when we were maybe your son's age, like we couldn't produce a video and put it on the internet yeah. for anyone to see like the video. I mean, my dad had a video camera. It was like, you know, like this big, like he's, you know, at the local TV station um, and a VCR tape could only hold like an hour. So like that, we just couldn't do it. It wasn't accessible. Um, and so to now be at a point where, you know, your son with, a phone and nothing else can film, edit, produce, you know, after effects, sound effects, they're put, you know, and, and launch it to an audience of, of unknown size, you know, that to me is so, so cool. And so I think more people become creators and watching creating become more accessible. Um, mm -hmm. And I hope that we continue to see that because I know there are still, there are still unfortunately a lot of folks who don't have access to, to even a smartphone as an, as a, as a resource. Right. And, and they may just may not have internet access that's reliable enough for that. There's a, there's a big digital divide, um, especially here in the U.S. So watching that process continue and watching these resources become more and more available, I think I'm excited to see whose voices we get to start hearing now that they have access to the microphone, too. Yeah, yeah, love, love your insights. And you know, it's interesting that uh, for me, it's hard to predict the future because when I invest in stock market or crypto and when <laughs> it's decreasing, I understand, no, no, it's not my way. But I know exactly if you create content uh, in this environment, you get experience and you can get can create content in the new environment to adapt your efforts because of this experience. It doesn't matter what future will bring, uh, who have experience, they will beat others without experience. So yeah, yeah. I definitely Absolutely. That. And I think there's something, there's something deeply human about wanting to be heard, you know, going back to like caveman days, like we would gather around the fireplace and tell stories like, that's still that's what we're doing in a sense right now is like we're here telling stories so that other people can hear it. Um, that to me is just is so cool. Like people are never going to stop wanting to be heard and just keep finding new ways to do it. Yeah. By the way, I found my camera, GoPro, you know, <laughs> there you go. yeah, I, I love this quality, you know, so small and yeah, I can film everywhere. And uh, the best camera, uh, it's smartphone, you know, because it's my, in my pocket and yeah. I film a lot more videos on my smartphone than uh, at any other gadgets. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's so yeah. accessible. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks, Melanie. It's a big pleasure to get on my show, to learn from you, share uh, how people can reach out to you, learn more about you, follow you. Yeah. Um, well, if you want to learn more about me, uh, my name is is right down here. Um, I, I'm the only one of me that you'll find. So if you search for Melanie Diesel on you know your platform of choice, you you should find me. Um, I, I love to connect with you all on LinkedIn and see what you're up to. Um, I, I spend most of my time on Twitter, like I said, where I'm at M Diesel. So at M D E Z I E L. Find me over on Twitter. Um, and you know, if you're curious about what we're doing for small businesses and, and how you can get some free help on, you know, discounts based on the fact that you're an important small business, even if there's only one of you, uh, check out the convoy.com. Uh, the convoy.com will let you join our free marketplace and, and start saving money for your business. Mm -hmm. Love it. Okay, guys, you can find all these links in the description below. Listen to us on Apple, Google, Spotify. Thanks again for your time. A big pleasure. Love it. You know, welcome back anytime because <laughs> I, I I love uh, valuable insights and I'm pretty sure that my audience loves as well. <laughs> well, thank you for uh, letting me share my story. <laughs>